All right, so welcome everyone to uh, one of the few science ofs that we have left. Um, so we have this week and then two more, and then we will be done for the year until January. So um, welcome if you've never joined before. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first time. If you have joined us, welcome back. I'm starting to let people in here. So if I'm doing stuff on the computer, I'm just letting um, some of our friends in. So today we're going to be talking about insect antennas. So uh, this is a very kind of a specific and kind of a niche thing. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is probably a little bit shorter than some of the other ones that we have been doing, uh, just because there's only so much information that I could find and to give to all of you. Uh, so it might be just a little bit shorter than some of the other ones that you've been on, um, but that kind of balances it out because some of them were longer. So I did see that someone put in the chat, uh, will this presentation be mailed out? So yes, everyone that is on today and that registered in general, uh, tomorrow morning I will send out an email with the Zoom link or with the link for the YouTube channel and for the link um, for everything else as well. So um, I'm going to do this really fast. There we go. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to still let people in here, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And it's thinking here. There we go. All right. So like I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about insect antennas. So uh, thanks everyone for joining. If you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and put them in the chat. There will be kind of <clears throat> stopping points where we can um, answer questions and stop and talk about them. Uh, but also there will be a point at the end where we can stop and talk and discuss as well. Just make sure that everything you're putting in the chat is kind and that it relates to the topic on hand. Otherwise, we do have that opportunity to remove you from the Zoom. Um, also, I want to point out that I am by no means an expert in any of the things that I talk about. Um, if you ask me something that I can't find the answer to or that I don't know off the top of my head, I will find out the answer and I will get back to you. So um, I just I like science. I do a lot of research for this, but I am by no means an insect antenna expert. So. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's go ahead and go through the basics. When we think of antennas, we think of mostly insects and that is what we're talking about today. Um, but there's also a few other animals out there um, or other creatures that appear to have antennas. And we will talk about those as well today. So what I really wanna start with first here is what is an insect? Just so that everyone is on the same page. You hear a lot of people, bugs, insects, um, that they're kind of just a, a correlated term term with each other. It's kind of like when people, for me at least, group amphibians and reptiles together. They couldn't be more different. Insects and bugs are a little more closely related, but it depends on who you talk to and if you're talking about true bugs versus not true bugs. So let's go ahead and talk about what an insect is. Um, so when we talk about insects, there's a huge diversity of them, um, but they are in the phylum Arthropoda um, and is the largest of the animal phyla. So if you think about mammals and birds and insects and reptiles and amphibians, um, there's a lot of reptiles, there's a lot of mammals, but it does not come close to the amount of insects out there. So they're very diverse. And you're gonna see that today when we talk about the different types of just their antenna, you're gonna see that even the antenna within the the same species sometimes can vary or the same group like beetles widely vary. So, um, but when we talk about an insect, they're going to have segmented bodies. So that means that they're going to have a clear defining um, different parts. And if you've ever heard like there's the head, shoulders, knees, and toes, sometimes for younger students, we go head, thorax, abdomen. So they have segmented bodies. They have jointed legs. So when you look at their legs, they appear to almost be like puzzle pieces. They come in together with each other. They also have something called an exoskeleton. So if you break it down, exo means outside. Um, or external, and then it is a skeleton. So they're kind of their support system. If you think about people, we do not have an exoskeleton. We have an endoskeleton. So that means that our bones and our skeleton is inside of our body. Um, so that out, uh, outside exoskeleton is unique to insects. Um, their body, like I mentioned, it's segmented. It's been divided into three regions, which also makes us think about um, spiders 
Those are not insects. They are different. They're arachnids, and they actually only have two body parts. Uh, so head um, usually contains the mouth parts, the eyes, and then that pair of antenna. And it is a pair of antenna unless something has happened. And then they have the thorax. Uh, normally, this has three pairs of legs, um, mostly in adults, and then one or two pairs of wings, again, just depending on the type of insect and the type of species that we're looking at. And then that final segmented area um, contains the digestive, the excretory, and then those reproductive organs, which all encompasses calling the abdomen. So when we look at a spider, I mentioned earlier, they only have two body parts. They have the head and the abdomen. They don't have that thorax region. And so their um, number of legs and their eyes and everything is just divided up within the two. And when I talked earlier about those jointed legs, there's six. So six legs makes an insect. If it has eight or if it has a hundred, it's not an insect. So now that everyone kind of is on that same page, let's move on to specifically talking about those antennas. So antenna, I'm sure all of us have seen an insect and we've seen antennas before, but what are they really? So antennas um, sometimes are called feelers, um, and that's true. They do help the insect kind of um, sense the world around them. They're that tactical receptor, but it is so much more than that. And it, again, it depends on the species, what it actually does for that insect. But it is a pair of sense organs that's located near the head. Um, like I mentioned, sometimes people call them feelers, um, but they are covered with olfactory receptors, so smelling um, scents, and they can detect odors and molecules in the air. So basically, they are a sense of smell for that insect. But again, depending on what species of insect depends on what they're using it for. Some insects, they do use it for a sense of smell. Other insects, they will use it to determine the humidity within the air. So it can detect very, very small changes of like water vapor concentrations. Um, sometimes mosquitoes, for instance, they will use it to actually detect sound. So you go from smell, which is one sense, to sound, which is another one. And in, even in some things like dragonflies and flies, they will use it, dragonflies use it to sense um, the air pressure and the air changes. And then flies will use it to gauge the air speed while they are flying. So um, very, very different among different types of insects. All right, so how did uh, these antenna come to be and why do insects really need them and how did they originate? So except for those spiders and scorpions and what we call non-insect hexapods, um, so basically everything else, all, our, all arthropods like crustaceans, um, centipedes, millipedes, when they are adults or in that adult form, and maybe in a larva form too, but adults will have antenna. So for instance, crustaceans, which if you think about like a um, crayfish or lobster or something like that, um, they have two Higgs head segments and they have two different types of antenna. So the first one is very scientific. It's called the primary antenna. So these are the ones, these are the primary pair. Sometimes people will call them antennules. And then sometimes they also have a second pair, which is a little bit longer, and these are known as the secondary antenna. So if all of you can think about a crayfish or a lobster, like if you go to Hy-Vee and you look at the lobsters, they have two little short ones and then they have two longer ones. Some species, they will branch away from each other. Sometimes they're just a single thread-like antenna. Um, so if they have two main branches, they're called biramus. If they don't have those two branches, they're called uniramus. So um, like here, thinking about a crayfish. So a lot of different types of arthropods, they usually just have a single pair of antenna. They have that single main pair that they use, but some types of animals have two different ones. Um, depending on the scientist and, and who you talk to, it really depends on if they consider those true appendages. So if we talk about like, feet and claws and legs and arms, those are to us true appendages. So humans, we have arms and legs. Um, sometimes people, scientists will consider antenna as a true appendage, which means that when they start to develop in the embryo, they are also developing those antenna at the same time. Um, but again, not every insect larva has antenna. 
So um, just like uh, in crayfish and sometimes in different types of animals like salamanders, limbs and antenna can also regenerate like legs in a lot of different species. So if something would happen or if they would break off, this is their main source of how they sense the world and they're very important. So the body will actually regenerate those like legs. All right, so when we look at antenna, um, what parts are we looking at and how can we tell which piece is what and how do they move? So insects or crustaceans, whatever we're looking at, today we're gonna focus on insects. They have paired antenna. So they are usually symmetrical. They have two of them. The overall shape is if you just look at them and you don't look uh, under a micro magnifying glass or anything like that, the overall shape is going to be elongated and they're cylindrical. Um, again, there's a lot of different ways that insects have kind of moved through time and depending on how they use them in their environment depends on what they're going to look like. But overall, if you look at them, they're long and they're skinny. There's also three major parts to antenna. Um, so there's something called the scape, the pedicel, and then the flagellum. So let's go ahead and kind of dive into what that looks like. So here's an image and how it kind of breaks down each piece. And this is not gonna be every insect because not every insect's antenna is gonna look like this or even be that long, but they are gonna have these three parts. So the scape right here is that very, very first segment, and that is where it attaches to the head of the animal. Uh, so the movement of the antenna is controlled by either one or two pairs of muscles that run right next to the head and right next to the scape. And again, just depends on how long they are, what they're using them for. Some insects, um, you will use their antenna during flight and some will not. So again, just depends on how many muscles they have. And then as you kind of move down the antenna, you have something called the pedicel. This also contains muscle connections, which gives it just a little bit more control over how it moves. The scape muscles kind of attach it to the head and the pedicel muscles help control how it moves or why the animal is using it. And then if you look at the flagellum, um, this depends on how long it is, but the whole thing is called a flagellum. And then the little individual pieces are called flagemeres, uh, which again, it depends on what they're using them for. This flagemere, the flagellum, this is what is most um, specialized in a lot of different insects. And that's actually what we're really gonna dive into today. All right, so we know that they use the world, um, their antenna to sense things and to smell, but it's not always just for smell. So there's tiny little hairs on the antenna and they're called sensilla. The, they're also, they look like hairs, but we know that mammals are the only ones that have true hair. So those little hairs are actually made of chitin in insects. Um, you may have heard the word keratin in reptiles and even people, we have hair, we have nails they're all made out of keratin. It's a little bit different substance as far as insects go, it's called chitin. So just a little different, um, but it looks very similar to hairs like on a mammal or something like that. So there's different types of sensillas depending on what they're used for. There's a chemoreceptorial sensilla, um, and these are those, um, basically they're smelling pheromones, which are different chemicals and different odors that animals will give off. Um, sometimes it depends on um, if they're trying to find a mate or if they've already mated or if they're trying to find territory. And the uh, pheromones are how they sense the world and they're using that for a smell. And then you have the mechanical receptorial sensilla. These are the ones that detect like pressure changes or if the insect is moving. So you have the chemo ones, the smelling ones, and then you have the movement ones, those mechanical ones. Uh, again, talking about different types of animals and insects and what they're using them for, um, taste, touch, smell, um, they're communicating through their antenna, trying to find food sources, trying to find a potential mate, sometimes even detecting out enemies and even dangerous substances. All right. 
using those sensillas, um, they have sensillas so that they can smell and figure out what's going on, but then how does that get to their brain? Uh, so they have a region in the insect's brain known as the deutocerebrum. This is where all that information basically goes. So for chemo, uh, receptorial sensilla, they will use these receptors and those they're sending that information to the nervous signals, and then they're able to basically like an olfactory bulb as far as things like uh, vertebrates. So in smelling, very similar to how we smell, we take in those chemicals, it moves through our neurons, it goes up to our brain and our brain saying, okay, you're smelling cookies baking in the oven, or that smells really disgusting. Um, very similar to how that works as far as um, the chemoreceptorial sensilla in insects and mammals. Same type of process. All right, so that was just a little bit about what they do, um, why they have them. And then now we're gonna go into, there's many different types. And we talked earlier about the three different parts. The flagemeres are the ones that are very variable. So we're gonna actually go through the different types of insects and the different types of um, insect antenna that they have and who uses them for what. So I don't think I have any, okay. So let's go ahead and move on. So there are some funky ones in here, I'm gonna admit. Uh, so when we talk about antenna, there's two main groups. You have segmented and you have the flagellate antenna. So segmented ones, each segment has its own set of muscles that will move it. And then the flagellate, it basically is controlled by one single one, and then it just kind of hangs free. It has its own set of muscles. Um, so from the scape, the pedicel, and the flagellum, each group has its own different types based on their lifestyle. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have seen the feathery antenna like moths have, very different even among species. So moths, um, different types of moths have different types of antenna, and we're going to look at that today. All right, so the very, very, very like simplest form that you can find is called a filiform antenna. Uh, and a great example of this is if you've ever looked at a grasshopper, they have true filiform antennas. These are very basic, they're very long and skinny. They do not taper though, they are the same width from the very beginning of that scape all the way to the end. Um, they have short, straight segments, but they are segmented. If you look in here, you can kind of see those little lines. Each one of those has different muscles where they can attach, depending on um, whether it attaches at the scape or whether it attaches at every single individual little one. This one is a really good example, like I mentioned in grasshoppers, but also some species of cockroaches have these as well. They're just two very large antenna. They're often thread-like, um, but again, for grasshoppers is what I focused on. They detect moisture in their food and the environment, and it will also help distinguish and detect or find those food sources. This is one of the most important tools for grasshoppers, like many other types of insects, and this is what they're using to detect their food and to detect that moisture level in the environment, but still just a very, very simple form of antenna. All right, now you have something called a monofiliform antenna. Uh, these look like a string of beads. The great example is termites. And you look here, you can literally see they look like a string of beads. So they're very, very similar to the filiform antenna, but they're a little bit more spherical. They're not as pointy. They're a little bit more globed shaped. Um, they're thinner and they're longer on the ends. Um, so for termites and some types of beetles, we'll have these as well. This is how they get around. This is, again, their moisture sensing reception. Um, and then they will also use them for touch, taste, and again, finding those pheromones. So this is a huge way that they smell. Uh, termites will also use these to feel vibration. So it's not just for smelling, they use them for another sense, which is their hearing. And they also can detect heat and cold with them as well. So we go from a very simple form of just a straight to a very basically a simple form of like a beaded uh, string of beads. Now they're gonna start getting a little funky. Here's one called a serrate antenna. So here, if you notice, it looks like a sawtooth or a serrated blade on a knife. Very similar, that's how it's got its name. Um, best example I can show you is a click beetle, but not all click beetles have the same type of antenna. It just depends on the species. Uh, so I didn't really go into species form, I just said types of click beetles. 
So click beetles are the ones they're kind of tapered on the ends. Um, they're kind of just a very blah, vague brown or black beetle. There's not really a huge um, distinguishing like look to them, but when they jump or when they get scared, it sounds like they click. So that's how they get their name, click beetle. But their antenna are usually always serrated, um, or sometimes they look like little combs at the tip. And if you look at this photo here, you can definitely tell that little serration on their in, on their antennas. Um, another thing about insects and how they distinguish between sometimes male and females is the length of their antenna. Not always, but most of the times, males are going to have longer antennas. That's just how it goes. Um, so oftentimes, they will use them as a, um, a way to intrigue females to come uh, be with them. And also thinking about they're going to have better genes if they have longer antennas. Uh, females of the click beetles, they usually have about two thirds the length of the antenna. So unless you have a male and a female click beetle right next to each other, it's really hard to distinguish if that's a female or if that's a male because they might look really long, but two thirds the same length is very similar. So looking to those together, it's really hard to distinguish if it's a male or female unless they're right next to each other. All right, this one's super interesting because they're so tiny. So not all of the cetaceous antenna look like this, but a good example is on dragonflies. This one also looks fairly uh, uniform and it looks fairly blah. There's not a lot of like serration. There's not beaded parts. Um, there are individual little um, joints on here, but on this one, they taper at the end. So they become like a little tip on the filiform and the moniliform ones, they um, they stay the same width through the entire antenna. So if you look at a dragonfly, this is like a super close up of a dragonfly. They have tiny, tiny, tiny little antennas. But this type of cetaceous antenna is also found on things like cockroaches, mayflies, stoneflies, dragonflies, damselflies, bristle tails. Uh, it just depends on what they're using them for in their environment. Dragonflies, um, they do have antenna, but they're not as big of a tool um, for them as other insects. If you're familiar with dragonflies, they have these huge eyes. That is their main sense organ is their eyes. They do need their antenna though. It helps them measure airspeed during flight, very similar to a fly. So they are important, but um, they use their eyes more often. So um, again, very important, but their eyes are kind of the critical thing here. All right, this one is crazy. It looks like a folding fan. It's called a lamellate, a I can't say it. It's this type of antenna. It looks like a folding fan. Um, so this type of antenna has the segments on it. Um, it kind of joints a little bit and then it fans out. Um, this one is a little bit harder to see if you are looking at beetles. Um, a great example though would be a scarab beetle, but not all scarab beetles have this. So it starts really small and then it kind of tapers and gets widened at the end like a fan. So here's an example in a scarab beetle. You can see um, very, very small. It looks like a little beaded segment and then it folds out. Um, so scarab beetles, this is their primary sensory structure. It's located at the, head, at the end at the second segment from the head. Um, it usually is composed of, of about 10 segments. And that's important because that oftentimes is how um, entomologists will distinguish a species from another species. It's counting the number of segments in their antenna. So with beetles, especially, and especially a lot of other types of insect, it's a very small, minute details, and that is how they distinguish between species. So um, these little leaf-like things are enlarged um, compared to other beetle families because scarab beetles use this a lot. Um, if you're familiar with dung beetles, dung beetles are a type of scarab beetle. And if you've been on previous Science Of, you know that they will roll dung um, up and they will use the Milky Way to kind of orient themselves. So scientists believe that that is why they have these kind of folding fan um, antennas on them because they use them for orientation, not just for smell. 
Uh, scarabs, they also have a huge diversity of shapes. So not every scarab beetle will look like this, but the ones we think uh, orient themselves or use the Milky Way, they believe that they have those types. All right. So this is a pectinate antenna. Uh, this one is mostly found on things like parasitoid wasps and sawflies. Uh, so right here, what you see is that it looks almost like a comb, but it is only those little projections are only found on one side of the antenna. So a little bit different than the ones that we just saw on the scarab beetle. Um, again, you've got the little pieces and the joints right next to the head, and then it fans out. All right, so some of these, I, I do admit, this is probably gonna be a pretty short science of, just because there's not a ton of information, but I'm trying to give you as much as I can. So um, the plumos antenna, this is one that you're gonna find in moths. So here, it totally depends on the species of moth though. So on these types that have the really feathery antennas, they're <clears throat> gonna look um, at using those to smell out those pheromones. So um, these are gonna be things like true flies and mosquitoes and moths. So they have a very feathery uh, appearance. Not all of them are gonna look like this. Some of them might be smaller or shorter, but they're still gonna have that same feathery shape to them. So here's another great example. I do not know what species of moths these are. Um, I know some of them probably aren't even um, found in Nebraska. I just looked for a picture that showed the real feathery parts on them. So the reason that they have those feathery parts is they're extremely sensitive to smell and are used to detect food sources and also to find mating partners. They do believe that some of the ones with the really huge feather antennas, they can detect uh, pheromones or those smells that are given off by unmated females um, at least a mile away. So getting even those small little pieces of chemicals in the air, that is why they have that huge surface area to grab more of those chemicals in and smell them. Uh, some moths, they, you, we believe that they might use them just for navigation because there's a lot of moths out there that don't even have a mouth because they never eat. So once they um, are a caterpillar, they go through the stages where they form a cocoon, then they come out as an adult. They only live sometimes for maybe a week. Their sole job is to find a mate and mate, and then they die. So sometimes it might be a week, sometimes it might be two weeks, sometimes it might be two days. So there's really no important reason for them to have a mouth. So why do they need feathery antennas that helps them sniff out food sources if they never eat? So some moths that have feathery antennas, scientists may believe that they might be used for a different reason, such as navigation, um, because they don't even have mouths. So why do they need to detect food sources? All right, so this is called the clavate antenna. Um, very, you're gonna see a couple of similar ones here, um, but this one looks like tiny little knobs, um, but it does get a little bit thicker towards the end, and then it kind of just stops. Um, this is found in a lot of animals like beetles, um, specifically carrion beetles. And I think, oh, I don't have a picture of one. Uh, we have a few carrion beetles in Nebraska, um, one of them being like the, um, burying beetle. So it will specifically lay its eggs on things like a dead mouse or a dead rat. Um, and then when those eggs hatch, it will eat the, the dead animal being nature's recyclers. So um, they have, they believe that they have these very thick antennas so they can smell out those dead, um, those dead animals to find them so they can lay their eggs. All right. So you also have capitate antennas. Uh, this is found in lots of different things like butterflies. Uh, butterflies will use them in addition to other things. Uh, so these are the ones that are, look very tapered and then they stop right away with this huge club or knob at the end of them. Um, we believe butterflies will use them for balance when they're flying, um, also to smell. And then they have those two antennas that are broken up with those knobs on them. They also work with their feet because their feet is where they taste things. Butterflies are just strange. They taste with their feet. Um, and they also believe that they use them to find food, to migrate, to mate, and to sleep as well. All right. 
And then you have um, these weird little abrupt like 90 point angle ones. Um, these are really found in things like wasps, bees, and ants. Ants are a great example. They use a lot of their um, antenna to smell. Um, so these are ones that they, they go up and then they're strictly bent or hinged at like a sharp angle. They look like a knee or an elbow. Um, mostly found in ants and bees, but these, for bees at least, they use the um, antennas to touch, smell, and even they believe a form of hearing. So again, using those vibrations um, to feel their way around and to hear things. Um, another thing that's, uh, really good for identification, especially male and females, males will usually have 13 segments of their antennas. Females only have 12. So again, pretend you're an entomologist and you have two species and you're trying to even figure out if it's a male or a female counting the number of segments and saying, okay, this one has 12, this one has 13. That is just your only way of saying if this is a female or this is a male. So small little minute details like that. That's why I could never be an entomologist. Um, but I do really respect the ones that are out there. Um, and then ants, they also have this type of antenna and they use them to find scents to kind of taste the air. They even use them to touch other ants as a form of communication or if their queen is around and then also tap um, the ground and then check out pieces of food. So this is their entire sensory world. Ants do not have ears along with a lot of insects. So again, using them as more than just a feeler or a way to smell their environment, they're using them to communicate as well. And then I believe that might be it. Yeah, it was a little bit shorter this week, but I know that some of the other ones have gone a little long. So it kind of worked out that we're balancing them out here. So hopefully you got a lot of information on insect antennas today. Uh, so next week we have two left. So next week we're going to be talking about catfish. So there's a lot of information on our um, eight species of catfish that we're going to talk about and the, the different characteristics that they have versus different other types of fish. And then we were supposed to have this one a few weeks ago, but we uh, changed the date because of a big reptile event that we had. So I just pushed it back one week. So our last one will be November 17th about the science of water birds or waterfowl. So talk about that. And then if you want more, someone mentioned, uh, is this going to be recorded? So yes, I did record this. It will be posted tomorrow on our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel under the playlist Science Of. And then we also have a Facebook page. We have an Instagram page. And then we have just a general Nebraska Wildlife Education website as well. All right, so that's all that I have. Please join me next week for Catfish. But I do believe that someone has... A question. So I'm going to stop sharing, see what's in the comments. Oh, someone just said, thanks. This, uh, this is interesting. So again, I always kind of worry when no one has questions because I feel like I either gave you too much information or that it was um, too confusing, but kind of a shorter one today. But um, hopefully someone said, thanks for the pictures. Yes, there. luckily there are great pictures online. Otherwise I was going to have to draw all of them and that, no one wants that. So all right. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully you learned a lot about insect antennas, and we will see you next week for um, the science of catfish. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week.